What's up everybody and welcome to video number two on this series of getting your first pistol and then becoming acquainted with it, which is what we're gonna talk about here today. There will be more videos we're gonna be having after this, getting into some practical firearms drills, some stuff you might even see in a class here at Vortex Edge with our instructors. We have one of those here, Chris Uridia, with me right now. He just talked about with me on our last video, getting your first pistol. Again, we're assuming somebody is a complete beginner here. This is actually their first firearm purchase in general, and also they're looking for something that's more general purpose. Maybe they're not sure that they're gonna be dedicated to competition or only concealed carry, something like that yet. They just want something that's gonna be good for a little bit of everything. Right. So Chris, you get the gun, you've gone to the gun shop, you've gone through all that stuff, and now you've got it, right? And you have to start getting familiar with it before you go whole hog and jump into a competition, I'm certainly assuming, or or maybe even come and take a class with us here mm -hmm. at Edge or head to the range, do really whatever. How do you suggest somebody go about, you know, all right, now I'm, I'm not at the gun counter anymore, I'm at my house and I've got a gun. What do I do with it? You know, getting acquainted with it. Yeah, the first thing is guys, I would become intimately familiar with the safety rules, right? Um, I've always been a proponent that the safety rules aren't there just for administrative purposes. There's direct practical applications to each and every safety rule that's out there. Um, so with that being said, I would choose an area of your house, right? That's where you're not going to be flagging anyone, you know, certainly free of any kids, you know, your wife, anything like that is just kind of, uh, in your own little corner of the house. Um, next thing you're going to do is obviously you're going to want to dive into your box here. So I'll do that. This is not actually a brand new pistol. No. Chris threw his, uh, threw his competition yeah, pistol in the box real fast. Right. So that's why it's a little bit of a tight fit. Yeah. All right. So uh, your handgun will more than likely come with a magazine inside of the magwell. So this uh, leads perfectly into kind of one of the very first things that I, I think you should do that. And that's uh, ensuring that you have a clear firearm and knowing that the, the condition of your firearm, right? It's something that's super important to me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick, pick it up and immediately point the muzzle down. I'm gonna remove any potential source of uh, ammunition. I'll set that to the side. And the next thing I'll do is on these Glock Gen 5s, you have ambidextrous controls, right? So you have your slides, your slide catch or your slide stop. As you're applying upward pressure to that catch there, you just pull, push and pull on the slide and it's gonna lock it to the rear, mm -hmm. right? This is the easiest way to ensure that you have a handgun, right? Or a clear handgun. So the first thing I'll do is make sure that my chamber is clear, make sure my ejector face is clear, and also make sure that I don't have any, any further sources of ammunition in there. Now this is a clear handgun, mm -hmm. and, and, and I, can, I can proceed to doing whatever I need to do. Now, should somebody, again, let's say they're getting acquainted with the thing, uh, do they go to the range right off the bat and just start shooting some live ammunition? Are they gonna do a little bit of dry fire, do you recommend? You certainly can, and, and I, I know that if I was at, a, at a, a gun shop that had its own integrated range, I'd be kind of tempted to just immediately go on the range and shoot it, right? Yeah. Um, but if you're not in a situation like that, then yes, I would absolutely take it back and make sure that the first thing I do is some form of dry familiarization with the gun and some kind of a, a dry fire training. Okay, and we'll get into actually some practical drills you can do with dry fire yep. here in a minute with Chris. Yep. Um, but yeah, that's all good stuff because you want to at least understand the trigger itself. I know having shot a number of different guns, there are, are guns that you get where they got a really heavy trigger. Um, and so sometimes you actually pull it to the rear and you're wondering, is this thing gonna work or not? Right. And you gotta give it that little extra bit. You see, okay, that's what I'm gonna have to get used to every time I pull the trigger now. Or then, you know, on, on uh, not necessarily pistols, I haven't dealt with this so much, maybe some of the really fancy ones, but certainly precision rifles, you'll run into this where somebody has a really light trigger. And then right. you rest your finger on it. Oh, that went off. Right. Good thing we were in a safe direction. Good thing we knew the status of the firearm and good thing we were dry firing all that stuff. But you do want to at least understand when you can expect the thing to go off. And hopefully, you know, it's nice and consistent and you got a, a decent trigger press. Right. But <clears throat> now um, we got some magazines here and I think that we're going to get into like, uh, like we were saying, a few dry fire drills for you to try out with your new firearm. Um, Chris, you have some dummy rounds that you like to throw in yes. with your dry fire training. So um, obviously this can get potentially a little dangerous yes, um, because you want to really ensure, again, you know the status of your firearm, you know what you're putting into the mag well. We're going to have potentially some magazines that you will have loaded up with live ammunition, and then you're going to have some training magazines. How do you keep it all straight 
uh, in your experience and uh, keep everything separated so that there's no worry of accidentally, you know, putting something in that, yep. that shouldn't go in at the wrong time. So the, the very first thing I'm doing is again, I, I, I isolate myself in an area of the house or your training area away from people, right? Um, I, and the next thing I would do is just again, take my life fire magazines, leave them right outside the door, just leave them somewhere where you can identify that, you know, hey, I'm not gonna accidentally grab something live and introduce it into my handgun, Yeah. right? Um, the next thing I do is I tend to dedicate a, a magazine specifically for dry fire. Okay. Right? So I know that if I look at it, the very top round is that orange dummy round and I, there's no confusing that for a live round, right? Either that or invest in a couple more magazines and just ensure that they're empty. And you, mm -hmm. there's certainly a lot of work you can do with empty mags as well. Um, but I would, I would definitely identify like an administrative point where you're going to put your live fire ammo and that's where it stays for the duration of your dry, your dry fire yeah. period. And I think a lot of people worry about the live fire ammo, you know, not being in the same room maybe as you are when you're dry firing, doing every precaution so that you don't end up accidentally lighting one off right. in a situation where you wouldn't want to. But I think a lot of people then can kind of get lackadaisical with their dummy round magazines or their training magazines right. where you think, well, this one's safe, so, you know, I'll throw it wherever and it'll end up in, you know, it might end up in a range bag. Yeah, it's just down there in the pocket. But it actually can be dangerous if that ends up in the gun when it's not supposed to as well, because oh. let's say you're carrying and this is something that you're intending on or you're sending it on the nightstand and you intend it to be a defensive weapon, now you go and you want a boom to go off at some point. Heaven forbid you end up in a situation like that and it doesn't. Yep. And you go like this and an orange round pops out. That's not yep. what you want. No, not at all. And there's certainly other steps that uh, here at the range we take. Uh, we tend to paint um, training rounds orange. Mm -hmm. Right, so that it's a visual cue that yes, this magazine uh, is a training mag. So there's no reason why before I leave the doors for, and go home for the day that that mag should be in the gun as I go to go get get in my car. Mm -hmm. So there's there's certainly some some other steps that you can take to kind of uh, ensure that um, one you're not you know blowing a hole in your house or that if you go to defend yourself, it's not going bang. Sweet. Yep. All right. Well, uh, let's let's work some of these drills here. And uh, you've got a really simple thing yep. set up here in the in the sort of what are we in the armory here? Yep. And this yep. is something you do pretty much every day. I actually see it on yeah. Instagram a little bit. Every day I try to get at least 15 minutes of, of some form of dry fire, whether that's and, and I'll get into this, but you know your presentation, your draw, and some kind of a mechanic uh, dry fire drill, such as a reload or something, just familiarizing yourself further with your handgun. Um, this is a pack of targets that we got from uh, the Ben Sager Pro Shop. Uh, Ben's one of the more uh, prolific uh, co competition shooters out there. Um, you don't necessarily need this. You can certainly just hit print on your computer and just stick it on, on a wall. Yeah. Um, as long as that wall is something exterior, preferably, preferably with you know a berm or something, or, or maybe even the wall. You know, we, we have the benefit of having concrete walls here. Yeah. So we're going to make sure that even if we have an accidental shooting, that that round is definitely not leaving facility yeah good basement unfinished portion some concrete exactly walls right. cinder block yep, walls exactly so right. cool you got a big one you got some little ones why yep. don't we set these things up and uh see some drills sounds good all right chris we've moved a grand total of five feet over here yes. to your dry fire area Entire. in the armory Entire. pretty uh pretty simple stuff what is that just basically eye height yeah just about eye height and you know uh the beauty of these little targets is they just allow you to no, you don't have to have a ton of room. You know, you can have three, five yards. Yeah, be, yeah. I mean, anybody could do this in the basement that we were talking about. Exactly. That, that line that you shoot from a lot or you dry fire from, I should say. What? Five, five. three, five yards, yeah. 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 Don't need a whole ton of room. Cool. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, now as you progress further along in your dry firing routines, you may end up throwing in something like this shot timer here. So we're not gonna use that today again because we're assuming this is probably the first time ever trying the dry fire thing out. So we're gonna set this aside. But Chris has a couple of just really simple things that you can work through and things that if you get down and you master, you know, which may take a while, I think you're still working on mastering Absolutely. after many years. Absolutely. Uh, but if you can get close to mastering, then it's really gonna help you out in a lot of different scenarios when you're shooting. So uh, Chris, what uh, what are we gonna do now that you got a couple targets set up? All right, so uh, we, we're in our training area. We're, we're certainly safe, right? We, we're, sent, uh, we're sitting here looking at a concrete wall. Mm -hmm. we're, kn we're knowing that even if I slip up, right, that round's not going past this wall here. Um, the very first thing that I like to work on is just your presentation, right? Which is the act of bringing the gun from where your hands would marry together, right? Whether you're drawing from the three o'clock or the appendix, uh, we can all agree that at some point in this general vicinity, 
right? Our hands are going to marry up, and we're just going to go through presenting the gun on, tar on target. Okay. So um, the first thing that I'm going to do, of course, I have my flag inside my gun. I'm going to lock my slide to the rear, right? Ensuring that my muzzle is pointing in a safe direction. I'm going to stow my flag elsewhere. And now the very next thing I do is a three-point safety check. Again, ensuring I don't have an ammo source, ensuring my chamber is clear, and, and ensuring that my, uh, my ejection board is clear as well. Okay. All right. Once that's done, I will then get my, my magazine that has dummy rounds. Right. I will seat that mag, and, and I want you guys to pay attention to what I'm doing. I'm looking that mag into the mag well. And as soon as that first round starts to disappear, I open my hand and ensure that the magazine is seated. Okay. Right? Once that's complete, I set my slide forward. Again, it's the same button, the same mechanism by which I lock. Only instead of applying upward pressure to lock the slide to the rear, I'm applying downward pressure, and that's what sends the slide forward. All right? Now, once that's complete, and again, if we're being honest with ourselves, if I go to draw my handgun from the holster, or if, I, if I'm here for, uh, at the three o'clock, I, if I flatten my gun out as, as soon as I can, and I go to marry my hands together, right, I would end up kind of in this position here. Mm -hmm. So for me personally, whether it's coming out of the holster, it's running around during a stage, I always tend to come back to just this movement here. Right? Okay. Um, and so for me, the more familiar I am, with ensuring that I can do that efficiently and get my get to my site sooner, um, it, it it has so much applications across everything I do, um, for me personally. So absolutely. Um, so what that looks like is I'll be in my ready position here. Again, my my elbow is tucked. I've got my 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 grip just more or less built, right? And I pick a spot on the target. Uh, for me, it's the A zone inside of that uh, USPSA target there, uh, the the, uh, the miniature silhouette. I'll burn a hole into it visually, and I'll bring the, the, the dot up to the target, right? And at this point, all I'm doing starting off is I'm prepping the trigger, right? I'm not necessarily going to the, through the entire trigger pull just yet, right? And that's one lap. And then I'll, I'll reset, I'll come back down. And then let's say I present my, my dot on target, and it's not exactly on target. Maybe it's left or right, it's up or down. Then I'll make those adjustments with my grip. All right, there it is. I'm back on target. Now, what I want to do here is I want to hold it for a couple seconds, mm -hmm. right? Because I want to imprint into my hands and into my memory what the gun feels like so I have ideal uh, a sight picture on target. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say you're adjusting your grip in order to manipulate if the dot's not perfectly on, is that because we're getting into a little bit of the natural point of aim thing where if you bring it up and it's not perfectly on, and then you start involving wrist and other musculature uh, features of your body to then move the aiming point, that's not exactly consistent. Right, exactly. Right? Right. So you want something where basically that grip, that's more of a consistent thing, the grip on the gun. And once you get that right, it should be to the point where basically without thinking or without having to induce extra musculature, uh, muscular strain of some sort right. on right. the gun, 100%. it goes right where you're looking. Exactly. Okay. Right. Um, he, here's kind of the secret sauce to shooting, right? Whether you're starting off, whether you do it, you've been doing it for forever. The point of, of breaking this shot is to be able to pull the trigger without interrupting the sight picture. That's, that's, that's it. If you can master that, that one thing, you'll, you'll be, you'll be good for the rest of your days. All right. So again, just to show you guys another rep. All right. And of course I've been dry firing like crazy lately. So it's, it's, it's there for me. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, if I, if I somehow have to make an adjustment, right? A lot of times if, when I find the dot is not there for me, it, it's coming up from the six o'clock. So I'll adjust, okay, there's my dot or there's my irons. I'll hold it for five or 10 seconds. All right, and I'll reset. And you didn't even in that one necessarily pull the trigger. Right, no. Because yeah. a lot of what you're working on is things actually leading up to the trigger press. Exactly. Um, and at what point do you actually begin to sort of load the trigger, if you will? I don't know if that's the right terminology, but... Yep. So uh, backing up, and that's a very important question, uh, because I, I feel like every safety rule has a practical application, mm -hmm. right? So if I'm coming out of the holster uh, and, and I go by the safety rule, never put, uh, keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to fire, mm -hmm. right? Am I ready to fire here when the gun's in, my, in, in the holster? No. Probably not. So there's absolutely no reason for me to start prepping the trigger here. If I'm at the 3 o'clock... Am I ready to start? Uh, am I ready to, to break a shot here? 
Absolutely not. So there's no reason for me to start prepping the trigger here. Now, if I drop my elbow and as a result, my sights are on target, could I perhaps start prepping my trigger here as the gun's coming up to my eye after I've made the decision that either the target needs to be shot or I've made a decision that I need to defend myself. Mm -hmm. Could I start prepping the trigger there? Probably yes, right? Because I can always get to that point of prep and come off the trigger, right? If I've identified that my, my target no longer needs to be shot, let's say, mm -hmm. right? I can, I can, I can, can de-escalate from that point, right? Or I can go ahead and break the shot. Okay. All right, so we've gone into, at this point, a lot of stuff that goes into preparing to actually break the shot. And we haven't really even necessarily broken the shot yet yep. in this dry fire drill. Um, so why don't you talk us through that point? So we've gotten the gun out. It's coming up to the right spot. We've prepped the trigger, and then it's getting into breaking the shot. How does that work? Now, I know you hear some uh, terminologies thrown around out there of what not to do. Like you've got slapping the trigger yep. and, and other motions like that that would basically induce a very immediate pre-ignition movement of the gun. Yes, That's yeah. what we're trying to avoid, right? Yeah. And, and I'm glad you said uh, the last term because pre-ignition push is actually what I have kind of fallen on instead of using a, a generic term as slapping the trigger because what does that mean, right? Yeah. Um, I think that what most people do, and certainly there'll be other videos for this, you know, <laughs> why we shoot low left and such, but I feel that the most common shooting error that we commit is that we're doing the right thing at the wrong time. Yeah. What I mean by that is everyone knows that there's getting ready to be some reciprocation in the slide, the round's getting ready to go off, and we certainly want to make sure that we allow the gun to, uh, your sights to rest back on target, right? Mm -hmm. We're the ones that kind of impede that process. The gun wants to do it on its own, right? Through gravity and just the, the, simple, the act of the, the slide reciprocating, right? It's a natural thing. Um, we're the ones that will push the gun down as that shot's getting ready to break, and, and essentially throw our shots off target, right? Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that I like to do is again, I'll, and of course I broke the shot there, but um, as you're going through your prep, right? You wanna make sure that you get all that pre-travel or that slack out of the trigger and you get really good at that, right? Mm -hmm. Once you've established that and you're being honest with yourself, right? You're asking yourself, is my dot exactly where I'm looking? Mm -hmm. If the answer is yes, then I would move on to actually breaking the shot, right? So I would go up here, and as my sights are settling, break the shot, mm -hmm. right? What you don't want to have happen is you don't want to get into a habit where you're over aiming on the target. Yeah, right? exactly. Uh, I think we've talked about that before. We've before. talked about it before because you've told me not to do it before. Right. That's right. exactly why. I can sit here and I can aim the absolute heck out of this target for 10 minutes. And in the 11th hour, right, still find a way to do this, <laughs> right? So. What, what I mean by that is I want you guys getting really good at uh, focusing on your threat, certainly. And then as soon as things are, are good to go, I want you breaking the shot. So what I mean by that is I'm in my presentation, I'm prepping the trigger, there's my dot, there it is on ex exactly where I'm looking, and as that's happening, we break the shot. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking in terms of being sooner, right? And not necessarily putting ourselves in a situation where we have to be fast. Yeah, and, and what's that phrase that they say? I think they say perfect is the enemy of good enough. Right. Because everyone right. tries so hard to be perfect, and every time you see a shooting scenario in a movie or a show or something like that, there's always this dramatic pause, and there's yep. just dramatic aiming sequence, and it has to be just right. Right. And you end up, it's like, uh, and the dots are, and you're like, oh, now i got to go. And then you wind exactly. up doing things at the exactly. wrong time. So I, I don't necessarily agree with the mindset that uh, slapping the trigger is a thing. But what, I've, what I have seen in my own shooting and, and certainly training other people is that it is possible to get in a situation where you're over aiming and mm -hmm. aiming and aiming and you're still aiming and then suddenly the stars, and the, moons, the stars and the moon align and you go, there it is! And now you're, yep. you're doing what's called whole hand squeezing and now that you're throwing your shots off, right? right? Um, if I could holster here, Jimmy, if you point at the targets, kind of finger gun the targets there. All right, yeah. All right. So here, drop your, your support hand. Okay. So if I were to do that, right, I'm, I'm, I'm up here over aiming. There's a little movement, a little movement. Oh, there it is. What did that do to your finger? Oh, yeah, the whole it's, thing went Exactly, down. right? right? So what I want to do instead is I want to set these three fingers and I want to set my grip there mm -hmm. and really work on isolating my trigger finger. You see that? So now I'm pulling the shot, 
without inducing a lot of movement. Sure enough. I can even take this a step further. I can put my entire second hand on here, my support hand, and still isolate the trigger and not induce any movement into your finger here. Does hmm. that make sense? Yeah. So the same principle applies to your handgun, right? I want to make sure that as I'm presenting my handgun, I've already got these pressures set and all I need to worry about is presenting, seeing, breaking the shot. Absolutely. Cool. So, yep. So there you go. That's one, and I mean, that's a dry fire routine I see you do still yep. every day. That's something that you're not going to grow out of, so to speak, as you continue shooting and getting used to your firearm that you just purchased. So yep. um, definitely something worth doing. I obviously, like we said, try and do it safely. And uh, I mean, don't try and do it safely, do it safely. Absolutely. And then um, there's gonna be more stuff that we go through here, but uh, it's a great thing to add to your repertoire of training right away. And uh, yeah, as usual though, um, like the videos and subscribe if you like seeing stuff like this. We're gonna have plenty more coming down the pike in this series around your first pistol and getting acquainted with it and uh, hopefully getting pretty dang good with it too. So, thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you on the next one.